Uh, well, thanks um, very much to uh, Fernando and also um, to Tom. Um, it's quite um, uh, amusing, actually, to think, uh, given the topic um, today, that you know, I think it was the last time I actually handed out a pamphlet is when we came down here um, to leaflet the um, MEAA uh, conference. So I'm not actually leafleting every day as I want to <laughs> mention to you this morning in a very beginning and starting way. I've even been doing a little bit of twittering. Uh, look, what I think today is about is, is very much looking at the new media environment that we're in and looking at where are the opportunities there, where are the risks, and my job this morning is to begin the conversation. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to start by saying is that we've all come on a journey um, to this place. And you, like me, uh, many of you are, are possibly journalists or have had some training as journalists or communications um, uh, specialists. Um, some of you have come from backgrounds of activism, some from journalism. We have a very, um, very experienced panel that can speak after me and about many of these matters uh, knows much more than I do. So I really want to set the scene and so cover a number of different topics. The reason the PowerPoint is there is really more for visual, visuals and illustration and examples um, that I've got. Now, as I said, we've all, we all have all come on a journey to this place and I actually find it quite helpful in trying to understand what's going on with communications at the moment which is pretty challenging. Um, I find it really interesting both to explore my own experience as a consumer and a producer or as someone who's absorbing constantly trying to sort of get to read things, I don't read nearly, probably like a lot of you I don't get to read nearly as much as I'd like to or experience, watch all the videos, that sort of thing at the same time. Um, keeping producing myself um, is a real challenge and I think to talk to other people about how they're experiencing media and communications is also um, very valuable. Well um, yesterday I was actually at um, or Monday I was at RMIT in Melbourne and that's where I was talking about uh, my own experiences with radical media which is where my pamphleteering days really go back to to the late 60s and early 70s. And uh, that, of course, was the time of the beginnings of offset printing. And it was that that meant that we could suddenly produce pamphlets and newspapers. And that seemed to us a like a complete revolution. And so I would say that media and communications is always um, changing. And one of the things I noticed as I went back to my old archaic, uh, 40 years old student newspapers, I took some down with me, um, and I noticed the number of stories we were covering. Even then I had a real desire to be a journalist, uh, accurate, accurate accounts of what was going on, was with a very big group of people similarly inclined. And we were covering stories then that weren't in the mainstream. We were covering um, what was happening in the prisons that never got covered. For 30 years people were bashed in Grafton prison systematically without it being covered in the mainstream. Uh, we covered uh, how cops were setting up people in um, beats. Um, that was when uh, uh, being homosexual was still illegal. So, you know, much has changed. Um, now, on my journey back from um, RMIT, I uh, saw the yesterday's banner headline uh, for the Daily Telegraph. And uh, I really was quite startled uh, when I saw it because I probably wrongly had not been following this whole thing. I was aware that the Sydney Morning Herald had done people's or sort of Sydney transport plans, tried connecting with their audience, interacting, as Tom said, between the governed and government. And now the Daily Telegraph, not all of you come from Sydney, I know, but the Daily Telegraph has developed its own people's plan for Sydney. Now, of course, people's plan to me will only ever mean one thing, I'm sorry. It means a great big warehouse in Woolloomooloo where some very old residents uh, assisted by an architect called Colin James were developing a people's plan for Woolloomooloo and that's where a lot of the language actually that the Daily Telegraph is drawing on comes from those beginnings of planning, participation in planning in the early 70s. Um, I'll just to visually illustrate that, here are the murals. This itself is a form of communication. Here are the murals in Woolloomooloo. 
uh, there the builders laborers there as the residents um, with the support the green bands. Now the green bands at the time were an idea which builders laborers withdrew their labor in order to save what was very became very large swathes of Sydney and much of what um, we enjoy in the inner city today would not be there if it wasn't for that. Now um, I say that more to say that words can mean many things but nevertheless um, what the Daily Telegraph is struggling with here and you know, our journalists may have more to say about this, is in a sense struggling with actually, you know, in very tough times for journalists uh, and very challenging times for journalists and the media, exciting but challenging, as the business models change, absolutely trying to, or at least appear to try to, but I think probably in this case, actually uh, connect to the audience. Now, or to, to actually and that's something I want to talk with David Higgins later on our panel because he and I have had some conversations about that before. But can we actually, can we as consumers of media, big media I'm talking about here, actually become participants in media and to what extent, that is a big question, to what extent do, do for example, the comments button enable participation and to what extent are they actually disenabling participation at the same time. But what we have here is, um, the people of Sydney, this is today's editorial, the people of Sydney know this, which is why they strongly stand by this plan. Um, now, you know, this was done on the basis of a, a, a survey of 1,300 people, I think, a fairly in-depth survey about what they wanted. Coming up very big is more big roads. Uh, that itself would be controversial, but nevertheless that has come up. I read um, yesterday the entire 30 pages because what I was asking myself for today was what does this offer the, the non-profit sector? Is there a way in for you? And when I got to the back of it, I found there was a young person who was living in Phoenix House who told their story. There was someone from the Consumer Health Network who put their views forward. So my next step, having sort of, uh, I also of course being a journalist, uh, recognised the Daily Telegraph has appointed a cabinet to steer this through and actually they were <laughs> exasperated with Barry O'Farrell, our Premier, because he's taking too long and doing too much consultation and dragging his feet. So they want to impel him to action. So they have a cabinet. Now part of this cabinet is a person called Gary Sturgis, who of course was sort of the pioneer. He was once a source of mine when I was um, at Fairfax and he was then working for Ga Nick Griner before he became Premier. So I knew him quite well and he really was the pioneer of the whole privatisation, private-public partnership and that is at the, very much at the heart of this plan and the tourism vision for Sydney. Anyway, critical or not, the question really is, um, you know, where is there an entry point here? Now I also, um, and here I've just got some of the stories you can see, ageing, age-old issue needs fixing. Uh, there's no doubt that there are, is, has been some allowance for voices here uh, to, and partly to stitch it together as a broad plan. Um, now, I, I will come back to that, but I wanted to say that the old and the new always continue together. While the Daily Telegraph is doing their people's plan, things are going you know, on as they have. This is a small local paper near Monash University in Melbourne and here are some contract cleaners and one of the organisers demonstrating on the streets. They got their picture in the suburban newspaper and today they are on the breakfast show with Fran Kelly because they're walking from Chadston to the city because that is what contract cleaners, about the distance contract cleaners work every day. Now I as a journalist can sort of think, oh that's a great story a second later, I could be on United Voices website, download their report, see there's a whole report on their length of time that they're war working, the, the very difficult conditions in which contract cleaners are working in this country. Probably some of you know more about that. And it's on the radio. And it's become a story. If it gets traction, which is always critical with media, it will become a bigger story. It's got to be more than just one instant. And, uh, Clearly what those people have thought of is a great idea to get out in the streets and walk to Melbourne from Chadston. And that, that goes back to very old media practice. I mean, that's what we used to do when I was campaigning and when you no doubt are, many of you are in the same situation sometimes with campaigns, where you've got to do something to grab media attention. So my point there is the old and the new continue. 
Now, I wanted to say something about um, local news. And first of all, I think that we, we cannot, I want to say today something about independent media, and I will come to that, and local media. But we have to work within a framework where the evidence shows that one, Australia still has a very, very concentrated media, and most of the traffic is going to the big media, going to the big companies. Uh, the big websites, news.com, smh.com, Yahoo, which is Channel 7, West Australian newspapers all together, they're the ones that are dominating the traffic. They also dominate the local media and the regional media, which is, I'm not telling you anything probably you don't know there, but um, you may not know that in West Australia, uh, the same company owns West Australia, the only newspaper in Perth, West Australian, the West Australian, uh, it owns t the biggest uh, television chain network, Channel 7. Uh, Win is closing down its regional news services there, leaving only Channel 7 really, and it also owns radio stations. So that's huge dominance in one very big um, growing state. Um, and most of the traffic is going there. But I think for, you know, you've always got to think about it in a complicated way, and you know, we could be talking about women's magazines right now. I thought I would just say a few things about local media. Because the, our two big print companies, or print online companies in Australia, I'm still using that word print, also own um, hundreds of local and rural newspapers. And so I think it's really, that is often a way to get a, a non-profit sector story out there. Every week, if I open our local letter, Western Korea, I see one or two. They're mainly press releases, but they are there. So I thought I'd have a look at the uh, Mount Druitt Local Standard, which is uh, one of the good things about the news.com website is that you can actually go to your suburb and get right onto what's there. That's much more difficult with um, Fairfax, in my experience, particularly into their rural newspapers, which I would like to see um, brought back into a central thing where you can search. And for example, you want to search homelessness. Uh, there was a story down in Narracoot in South Australia last week I'd like to see that um, searchable on the main Fairfax websites. That's a slightly detailed point. Um, uh, now, Mount Druitt, this is the Mount Druitt newspaper, and what I noticed here is that you can actually write your own news. Now, you probably can't write your own news. You could probably only write certain sorts of news, but nevertheless, there's an entry point there and you will immediately come up on the website. So, um, I found here an unemployment story uh, Matthew Jennings was living on Struggle Street, sleeping in his car. And this is a little story about Matthew Jennings. Actually, when I read it more, I found that, um, sorry, I found that this was in fact, there's a thing called tag training that had two stories. It was extremely promotional. It's a small company. And I kind of was left feeling, was this public relations or was it journalism? But nevertheless, I think there are opportunities there. Um, now, I think when we come to the panel, I really want to get um, down more into what do our experienced panellists feel about to what extent has it changed for NGOs, to what extent is it the same principles in a new scene, and to get your ideas on that. But because I haven't got too long, I want to mention here today the independents um, who are now, if we look back to the 1990s, in terms of those of us who really want to have an independent media in Australia, it was very grim days. You know, people tried to start independent magazines, they largely failed, the I, I think the Independent was another one, and those days are gone. And I think that is one very productive thing that's come out of new media for Australian media. That doesn't mean they get huge traffic, it doesn't. But nevertheless, they're there. And Marnie is here today, the editor of New Matilda, to go on the panel. Um, Here's just some of the ones that you, I'm sure you, many of you are visiting. I think it is a question as to what extent stories on those sites get traction, but I think always with communication you're talking to your, you need to think about the public. Which little public, you know, publics, not pub, big public, publics, which public are you talking to? And I have a feeling that through things like Crikey and through things like New Matilda, Hoopla is Wendy Harmer's um, uh, outlet for older women, and um, I've had a good look at that. I find, you know, it's quite again promotional, but nevertheless, there's um, you'll certainly find stories uh, that would be uh, come from areas in which you will be interested. Um, I think it, um, it 
may build, it may build a knowledge. People who are interested in one issue, like say unemployment, may find they're also going to be an audience for other issues that are social justice issues. So it may be building a public uh, constituency that in turn uh, takes so social action. Um, I've put up here as an example, the newest one is the Global Mail. It is indeed a magnificent opportunity for journalism that 15 million people, 15 million dollars have been given over five years to uh, a set of journalists. It's sort of weird journalistically because they don't have to have advertising in the sense they don't have to have an audience because they've got all this money. <laughs> and perhaps that explains the somewhat unfortunate website which I think I would only be the last person to comment on those who visited it. But you know there's plenty of time to change that and I'm sure it will be changed. But Ellen Fanning who's a well-known journalist has done two-part series here on the whole disability scheme. It's really in depth. Um, I don't think loads and loads of people are going to be reading it, hundreds of thousands anyway, but it's something that you could send to people that's going to be a really good background, uh, well researched. And uh, you know, as I was looking on New Matilda yesterday, now this person here, what's, what's happening with this independent media is that people are, um, are participating, who've got, in a sense, good writing, maybe not necessarily super um, easy to read writing, but good, sound, clear writing is really, at the end of the day, all that matters. And here you've got something that actually goes back into that issue of, privatisa of privatisation in Queensland that's undoubtedly, I've heard so many times in the media this week, oh, that's been you know, really important, but no one actually going into how important or what actually happened. So you do get stories that aren't covered. Um, uh, by the rest of the media. And uh, uh, another person is Guy Rundle. Uh, he's from a social justice, more progressive journalistic background, um, but he um, is writing uh, pretty regularly for Crikey. Uh, now, um, where's Fernando? Because someone wind me up when I need to finish. Is Fernando here? Uh, anyway, I hope I'm not talking for too long. Let me just Okay, I'll, I haven't. I, I, it's important to get onto the panel, so I, I won't talk for too much longer. But this brings me to social media. So all of that is happening out there, and uh, people are both participating, consuming it, sharing it on Facebook, passing it on. And I wanted to talk a bit more about Twitter than about Facebook. Um, I think Facebook is certainly attracting. Um, tr uh, if, if a story gets shared. Um, that is a definitely a, a way of traffic going back to websites uh, more than what people uh, expected. And I've heard several people say that with, uh, new, with uh, small media. I'm not sure what the story is with um, big media if traffic is coming from Facebook so much. But um, I thought it would be interesting to have a little bit of a look at Twitter because it, it is something that is really different. Now look, one thing is you can't essentialise any sort of media. You can't say it's, I've heard people say Twitter is this, Twitter is that. Twitter is a lot of things. Twitter is a conversation between people. Uh, Twitter is journalists. Actually it's like a form of journalism. I see it as that. Um, it's a PR thing for government and it's politicians getting out there and it's PR as well as journalism. So it, it's all these things mixed in together and the fact it's mixed in together is really significant. So here just in this one screenshot what I've got here is, um, so I, I won't go into the details here, but this is just an individual person uh, linking back to a story, uh, something to do with needles on trains. And then we've got an announcement from City Rail, and then we've got um, train, another announcement. And, but the top one, which has got cut off, is actually Christine Keneally actually coming in and saying, well, look, remember all that stuff about, you know, labour and rail and everything, well actually it's not necessarily better and she's, you know, I haven't checked her figures and of course I'd be sceptical being a journalist but she's actually saying, hang on, you know, actually things might be worse. So she's intervening and probably in potentially quite an effective way because there's certainly consumers on this site. So here on this one we've got um, Hugo Brown, now he is probably, I think, just a customer out there, he's on Twitter, twittering about his life. And he actually finds the guards, <coughs> fancies the guards, or they're nice and pleasant. And then we have Joe Hildebrand, 
who you will know, who's a really senior journalist, regularly on Q&A, and he says, to be fair, there's a lot of people who find travelling on City Rail really comfortable, they're called guards. Well, that's a pretty mean thing to say, um, but he's, he's, he's certainly out there engaging, shaping attitudes. Um, it's a very interventionist type of tweet to do. Then we've got um, someone down here, again, an observer on a train. And of course, Joe Hildebrand's probably seeing that. And then we've got, since city rail guards can't do anything, can we make them fashion police? Trains will be a great starting point. So a lot of negative, mean stuff out there, but at the same time, there's other stuff as well. Now, um, one of the things now, again, I want to stress, I'm just a beginner here, um, as uh, some people might know who see me on Twitter, so I'm not setting myself up here as knowing a lot, but yesterday I saw this work victim's diary. They've got a whole Twitter account and a website. So I thought, well, you know, I wonder who they are, what they're doing. So I just sent them a direct message uh, uh, saying, you know, are you in this for the media or are you actually just building, you know, a group? And I got um, an e a text back for them, a, a Twitter back. And of course, as a journalist, I could engage with that um, very easily and take it further. So last night, I'm sitting on thinking about this talk, and so I've been watching this New Start campaign. And you know, honestly, um, I'm not in the nonprofit sector, but I don't know how anyone could be living in Sydney, in Newtown, where I live, on 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 New Start. And I think there's huge potential to build that as a campaign. So I went to um, the CEO of Anglicare, um, Millard, I hope I've got his name right. He, um, yes, uh, wrote, now I want to say, he wrote an article for The Drum about this New Start campaign. It's easy to read and it's, um, it's there. It has 263 comments on it. Some of them are negative, some of them are nasty, but many of them are constructive and there's insights there into the unemployed and some of the situations in which they find themselves. So as a journalist, again, a great source for me. Um, he has got loads more comments than the Daily Telegraph's um, People's Plan had. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I wanted to say. When I went on to Facebook, it's really slow. I mean, Andrew Bolt would have got heaps more yesterday down in Melbourne or wherever he's been syndicated yesterday around Australia. Um, he would have got many more. I'd be surprised if he didn't. But 263 is a genuine conversation. Um, I think the Daily Telegraph will struggle to get this participation going because it is not, in fact, generated from below. It is actually, you know, despite the survey, and that's going to be the struggle. But on the other hand, you know, they are trying to grapple with these issues. Um, and so here's 243 comments. And one of them was an extra $1.45 per week, won't even buy a cup of coffee nowadays. So that was from an actual a person who is on Newstart. So I took a quote um, from uh, Millard's article. So I actually took a direct quote, slightly paraphrased it um, in order to get it into 140 characters and put a link to the article. And by this morning, I had at least two or three retweets. And I, I didn't have time to count them, but that was probably at least another 10,000 people that that would have gone to. So, you know, I'm always a little bit of a campaigner at heart. You know, um, the Daily Telegraph are campaigning, I'm campaigning. You know, as a journalist, the most important thing is that you're ethical, that you're accurate and you're fair, but you, you can come from a particular position. So obviously Twitter appeals to me and Facebook from this point of view. And... Um, slides were a slightly out of order, so now I just wanted to say now move from Twitter and just say a little bit about public interest and public service journalism. Look, there are real question marks now over the, um, the media, to what extent in meeting the challenges to keep the people employed, to keep the profits going. Um, you've got many committed journalists in there uh, doing their best, but nevertheless I think myself it's a fairly tough um, call. Um, and so you've got the paywalls going to go up on News Limited. You've got Fairfax depending on an advertising model. And both of those have their issues, I think, from the non-sector and um, social justice perspective. So there's this whole issue about public service um, journalism, public interest journalism. Uh, can that be grown 
and actually either in collaboration with big media, um, what is the potential for that, or else in collaboration with NGOs as another potential, or independently through the universities, what is the possibilities here, or possibly with the ABC SBS as well. So I hope we get some conversation about that. Christopher Zim is on the panel and he's um, a very experienced journalist. He's been working at Choice and has been doing some investigative journalism there. And um, I thought it would be good to mention Democracy for Sale. Uh, this Norman Thompson's just retired, I think, from this, this week, uh, ex-academic who put a huge effort in uh, with also Levi Adams before she was um, in the Senate. But um, this is a real development in providing public information about donations that is very easily searchable, comes directly out of the tables, uh, the government tables, onto this, is accurate. And this is the sort of thing, provision of inf information that, we're mo that I think we're moving towards. Um, and this again is where information in journalism, it has to be a story, however, if it's going to work in journalistic terms. This is a really um, great project that was done uh, by USA Today, a very um, big newspaper, uh, again, battling with um, business models, and they came up with this idea where they worked with scientists and they fed all these fusion tables in. I always didn't know what a fusion table was, so that's, I'm not even really sure now, but anyway, they, they used uh, scientific tables and they produced a website that you can actually search your school and you find out um, what percentile it's in, in terms of toxic chemicals in the um, environs of the school, and you find what percentage are in the nearby schools, what percentages of chemicals they have, and uh, along with this goes features, individual stories, an amazing project. It was won a lot of awards. Now, of course, the difficulty with these projects is, and I noticed Global Mail has done one on nurse, on nursing homes is how to keep it up to date. Uh, the Sydney Morning Herald did a very good one on fossil fuel lobbies uh, leading into COP15, but it's all out of date. And that, that's a real obstacle and I think something, and that's again where there is room, I think, you know, because labor is money, um, there is role for um, the universities to play a part. But then we have our own quality assurance issues. We have uh, many, you know, sort of, it's not just as easy as saying, oh, we'll do it with the university. Actually, each one project, Tom did one last year for Crikey, uh, with Crikey, um, which was about mental health and housing in Australia, very powerful series. I did this one with students in London, Hong Kong and Sydney um, on plastic bottle industry. It's got everything from in-depth features. This is a slide taken only last week of a university conference with a plastic bottle on every... Uh, shelf. Um, we had a map down here, over here, of where all the global um, bottled water bans are. But again, uh, there's a bit of a potential to keep this one up to date, just all freshen it up. You can, it's hard to keep the, the full data set up to date. Now, I'm not going to say too much about the Finkelstein report. Um, I'll just take a couple more minutes to comment on this. First of all, I'd urge NGOs to read it for themselves. And uh, this is the independent media report. Uh, it's been, got a lot of coverage. Ray Finkelstein has recommended a publicly funded news media council. I think most commentators would say it's probably not going to happen. Uh, with Carl Sandilands yesterday with the um, Australian Communication and Media Authority um, finding that it was a real problem, that he had abused women in such a gross way, I noticed there's no real outcry about that ruling, um, though there may be a little bit of an outcry compared to the outcry against Finkelstein. So I think there's a lot of politics in here. Now, I have heard some people in the NGO sector say, well, Julian Disney is the chairperson of the um, press council and he understands about you know, our issues. Well, look, I w not that I don't think he necessarily does because he was once president of ACOS, but uh, Julian's got a job. Julian is a um, very good negotiator, as some of you will know, and that is the job he's got now is to get the best deal he can for what he believes is right for the press council. Um, in this new news media council, there is a lot more scope 
for the non-profit sector to have a real voice at the table of um, the News Media Council. Now, even if that doesn't happen, I really believe it will be worth connecting with the Press Council and whatever else comes out of it and trying to get representation for the non-profit sector. Um, and Julian, um, since he went to the Press Council, has had some sessions with NGOs as well as with academics and with journalists, of course. Um, now, uh, so uh, rather than I don't want to argue the for or against of um, the model put forward by Finkelstein, but I would say that he comments, and I think rightly so, on the pretty well um, very dismal situation for regional and rural media, despite the fact there might be one or two journalists out there at rural newspapers, and says that that is in need of urgent um, government subsidy and support. And I would really like to see the NGO sector engage there. Um, some of those models, the different ways that public interest journalism can be done, might be one thing um, to think about. Um, or to do some, uh, you know, who knows what exactly is going to come out of it now, because there's, with Finkelstein, it's actually waiting on the convergence report, which is going to be a much bigger deal again. And I think that that's all going to take a while to sort out. But it, it is, would be worth, I think, maybe even out of this conference, some sort of group actually looking more carefully. I would be certainly interested in working on something like that on the um, rural and regional media. Now, of course, the, the big media companies are saying they don't support um, any public subsidy for media or for the press council. Julian Disney wants public money for the press council. He also wants a research function. So you've got a lot of different positions here. Um, but I think that it is possible to think about public interest models that actually can go in cooperation uh, with big media. And certainly we're looking at that um, uh, through the ACIJ, as well as with um, the smaller media, which we've already got some experience in cooperating with. Um, so um, I think with that, I should finish and actually introduce our panel. Um, I think I shouldn't, where's Fernando? Should I, I don't think I should take <coughs> questions. I think I should go straight into the panel because I think time probably. Um, so, yes, so I'll just introduce, do you all want to come up? Yeah. Uh, Christopher Zinn. Yeah, Hi, Christopher. Yes, so. Um, If any of you have got any things you would like to uh, ask me about or discuss further during the breaks during the day, I'll be staying here all day. W so. Wendy, can I just yeah move that we clap you? Yeah. A really great panel here, I think. Um, all of them actually are um, journalists, but the first one, Christopher Zinn, I'll start on the left. Uh, many of you possibly know Christopher as a um, journalist um, with a lot of experience across all media, actually, um, radio, television, um, print. Um, he was a finalist for a Walkley Award for an investigative um, piece that he did. And then he took a move and he went to choice. And uh, he's been a choice since 2007. But actually, in researching this this morning, I saw that you're leaving. Um, you're leaving soon. In, in about six days, yeah. In um, about six <laughs> days, yes. Yeah. So it's going to be great to get the benefit of your experience at choice, where you really, I think, have taken things in a bit of a different direction. Um, pro and um, it's going to be good to get that perspective. The next person is um, Mani Cordell. Um, I actually met Marnie when she um, was the editor of um, Spinach 7 um, in Melbourne, which was a small alternative magazine. And um, I was really impressed by that because, you know, I know how hard 
you know, can be to keep independent media going. And you know, that w that one actually did was in the news agents. It did keep going for a while, and and then she came to Sydney, and she's been involved since the beginning in New Matilda, which I think has been going since 2007 now. Uh, um, four. Yeah. 2004. Yeah, no, it's older. I came in 2005. And. Um, it, it was originally with the Centre for Policy Development. It's, it's split with that and it's a completely independent media outlet of which Ar um, Marnie is the editor. And uh, she's recently been to Indonesia where she's done doing an investigative series from then about uh, funding of um, various operations uh, in Indonesia by the Australian government. So great to have you here, Marnie. And then David Higgin Higgins. Um, I first met David. David is a very, very experienced journalist. Um, first of all with the Australian newspaper, then with the um, Sydney Morning Herald. Actually, I met him when he was, um, I think, features editor there and he was, um, I saw what a, he knocked it or something I'd done into shape very rapidly. And, um, and then he went to news.com. And he was one of, the, I think, the pioneers or the journalists who weren't going to drag their heels because there was an awful lot of that and actually embraced um, new media, went to news.com um, and um, he's, he's still there now. He's actually in the network tablet editor innovations, uh, more in the sort of specialist part. Oh, yeah, I'm uh, working more on tablets at the tablets, moment. Tablets, so yeah. So David, I see on Twitter, and sometimes <laughs> he corrects me. <laughs> And then Gary Linnell. Um, Gary is, again, a very experienced journalist. He's worked at um, uh, Fairfax uh, before he worked at, uh, he was the editor of the Daily Telegraph. He's also been at the Bulletin. Um, he left the Daily, having edited the Daily Telegraph, he went back to Fairfax where he's now the editor of um, Fairfax Metro, which I th my understanding is that encompasses the Metro newspapers and the local ones. Um, Gary's got a very strong reputation as a feature writer, um, as well as now being a sort of editorial, the high the editorial levels of the media. So um, I'm sure you'll have some questions too. Um, I just um, thought I would start with one um, very broad one and, and actually ask about um, change and maybe um, give each of you uh, a, a chance to say something about that. I mean, You've all been uh, in the media for a considerable um, period of time and you know, the essence of journalism really is the relationship between journalists and their sources. You know, that's really an important part of it. So Gary, um, first of all, you know, I wanted to ask you, do you think um, that uh, sort of new media as we call it or social media, development of the internet has really changed um, relationship with the, is, would it have changed the relationship with the non-profit sector? Um, has it opened up n more opportunities or has it in fact made things tougher for disadvantaged groups to get stories into the media? Yeah. Do you have a take on yeah, that? I think the and I'll the ask each of you to make a comment. Yeah, I think the issues facing NGOs are very similar to the ones that we're facing right now in you know, mass media, which is um, you know this incredible firestorm that swept through our newsrooms over the last 10 or 15 years. and. I think Fernando said at the start that um, a lot of you out there are grappling with how you cope with these changes. Well, welcome to our world because we're trying to grapple and cope with it every day. Um, I, I think the, the best example of that is um, about six or eight weeks ago on a Saturday, e early Saturday evening, on my 18-year-old daughter sent me a, uh, a message and it just had a link to a YouTube video. And so I clicked on it and up came Kevin Rudd's face and for the next three and a half minutes he proceeded to swear as much as he could about his Chinese and complain about his Chinese translator. Um, and I thought, gee, this is a really good story. There were only 300 views at that stage on the video. And my daughter, who'd been at a barbecue in Melbourne, had picked it up from her Facebook um, feed and had alerted me. And I then told our news desk, who already knew about it and was starting to move on it, um, and we're in the midst of this viral storm that was starting to engulf the story. And I think within a couple of hours, the video had had 20 or 30,000 views. And within five hours later, there were parodies of the original vi uh, video <laughs> appearing on YouTube. So, you know, for us, you know, this is all about change as well. And 
you know, we've got journos tweeting, we've got Facebook pages out there, we're bringing in social media experts now to better coach our people on how to use the form. But the biggest change for us, and I think the biggest change facing you guys, is who is your audience? Um, because particularly in old print media, in particularly in newspapers, we've been very fortunate over the last 200 years or so, we haven't really had to worry about them too much. You know, we've liked to think that we know them. Well, we didn't. Um, we had very scant data on who was reading newspapers, what they actually liked to read. We kind of had a very fuzzy kind of image of, um, say, a broadsheet newspaper reader and a tabloid newspaper reader and kind of the material they liked to uh, consume. But we never had the real hard data. And now with things like iPads and our apps, we're getting minute by minute, hour by hour data. I spent 18 pretty tumultuous months at Channel 9 back in the 2005. And one of the great things about that job was at 8.30 every morning, I could sit in my computer and watch the ratings come in. So I knew that at 6.30, if a current affair did a miracle bra story that added inches to your cleavage, <laughs> and it went off, and everyone <coughs> stayed on past the commercial break and came on, we'd rejig that story and do it again the next night because we knew there was a demand and an appetite for it. And we, had, we could track it down to the minute when they turned the remote control on and when they flicked over to Channel 7. In newspapers and, and mass media, we haven't had that luxury. We haven't really known our audience, and now we are. We're getting data on our iPad app that who's reading the recipes and how long they're spending on each page. And all that stuff's coming through now. So the implication for you is we're going to know our audience pretty well over the coming years. <coughs> are you? You know, what's your audience? Who are you targeting? Because your audience can't just be the mass media anymore because it's fragmenting so quickly. It's like a waterfall, it's just cascading everywhere. And you need to understand your audience and your reach and what you're trying to do a hell of a lot better than what you are now. I think, um, I might just maybe move the mic over, uh, Gary. Um, I um, very much agree with Gary on, uh, on on the audience, and I think in some ways that you have an advantage over, um, I don't like to use the phrase big media, but I, I, I don't know that's that helpful, but, but over um, mass media, let's say, people, um, publications uh, um, that are trying to get out to many different types of people at the same time. And it, it, because if you understand your audience, your particular audience, and if, even better if you know who they are, as you um, no doubt um, do through your conferences and your newsletters and your, and your lists, um, now you have the ability to go directly to them. And so for me, if we're talking about change, it's, um, it's about disintermediation. In other words, um, you would have seen recently if you, um, for the journalists in, in the room, if you um, keep a watch on uh, you know, a word like journalist or editor in, in Seek, you'll see the ads come up um, from people like um, Commonwealth Bank and um, City, City, City of Sydney Council recently instead of advertising for publicists, they're advertising for editors. So the council has an editor now, the Commonwealth Bank has an editor. And that's a, a very much a recognition of organisations who are um, you know, cleverly getting, you know, at least if not ahead of the curve, right there on the bleeding edge and understanding that, um, that if you know your audience, um, you know, perhaps it's um, more powerful for you I if you're um, clever enough about it to go directly to um, your audience rather than try to get that kind of old-fashioned free ink approach. And I think the skills um, that are coming through from, um, um, from schools like UTS will pop up uh, more and more in, uh, in areas that perhaps in the past would have been called publicity, but, um, but now have uh, much more of an ability to go um, directly to, to audiences, and that, that's where I'd be focusing. I guess I'm in a fairly different position because we're, as a smaller media outlet, we've always been a bit more in touch with our audience and it's not something that's incredibly new to us to get direct feedback from people. And I think because of that, um, that has put us at a bit of an advantage in this new environment where um, the bigger media are struggling to sort of cope with the fact that they're suddenly, they, they know who is reading what when um, and they're getting that direct feedback that I think smaller media has actually always had. They've always been very engaged with audience and at the cold face a little bit more. Um, I guess the thing that I wanted to say is that the danger in this new environment or this evolving environment is that um, the media, are, I've noticed this shift of sort of being pulled into chasing hits at any cost a little bit um, and that's probably a challenge for 
people working in the not-for-profit sector as well and NGOs who are trying to get worthy stories into the media that aren't necessarily going to go viral or aren't necessarily going to get the hits that a, you know, a video of Kevin Rudd swearing will get. Um, so I guess that, to me, as someone in the independent media, I'm very focused on, okay, well, this might not be a story that's going to be read by millions of people, but it's important, and it's important that um, as independent media we're, we're still telling those stories even while the bigger media is sort of going into this uh, this movement towards looking at the data, looking at, okay, who's reading this and, and chasing hits uh, chasing hits rather than keeping a focus on uh, quality media and quality journalism. Um, I also think, just to pick up on something that Wendy said in her introduction this morning, working with, we obviously work quite closely with not-for-profits and NGOs um, with the journalism that we do. The thing that we find the most useful is, um, as you were mentioning, organisations like Democracy for Sale, the reason they were able to work closely with the media is because they were actually crunching numbers, they were doing original research. Um, we often get pitches from NGO workers saying, we've got some great sources, can we write a feature article for you? That's not so interesting to us because we can obviously go and find those sources ourselves and interview them ourselves. But um, projects where, uh, collab we're collaborating with NGOs, where NGOs are doing part of the research or doing part of the number crunching are very useful for smaller media outlets like the Matilda and Crikey. That's the kind of thing that we're interested in. Yeah, thank you. When, when Gary was talking about his tweet, I, I bet going on his mind was that's a great story and that was the excitement that when he was a cadet journalist, you know, on Mean Street somewhere was that's a great story. And what the point I'd like to get across, because we have this in choice too, we've got to had to get to know our members a lot better and there is an avalanche of data about every single story that goes up about who clicked on what and how long. And I would hate to think, while that kind of data is important, I would hate to think it distracted us from what was the important thing and that is what is the story. Because these stories and these idea of stories go back deep into our culture and civilization and really I don't believe are significantly affected by uh, the technology, be it uh, Wendy's Offset, Litho Press, or, or Twitter, or wherever else will follow it. I actually believe that uh, you know, you're in a, a fantastic position because your stories are human stories. And one big part <coughs> of the media that I have come to appreciate, uh, which I probably didn't when I was working so much in it, is, the, uh, is to feed the need for humans to empathize with others. And that's what you can deliver has to be in different ways, naturally, it has to change, but don't lose sight of what is a great story, because I think as journalists, that's what really drives us, and as I'm afraid, the marketing people get more and more control of uh, some of our organs, because they're the people who have the data and feed it back, they try to say what the stories are, because they say that's what more people hit on, so that must be the most, the bigger and more important story. And I think as journalists, as you guys, we need to keep these people uh, at arm's length with pitchforks in the nicest possible way because they're very nice people, but really defend what's important to us and also, more importantly, for the readers and what they want. So, uh, so, so Christine, you, you made a point then um, about th these are stories that you people can deliver to us. Um, uh, the human story with the crunched in numbers as possible. Um, can I ask then, uh, maybe starting with David, but we'll... Um, David, how, how do you think stories should be delivered now? I mean, have we gone past the time of the media release, or would you like a video, or <laughs> do you want a package, <laughs> or um, you know, P, public relations people, I don't want to say you're public relations people, but communications people talk about delivering packages to the media. What do you, are you interested in packages? Uh, Sophie, the um, tablet, because that's you know, a good visual. Look, I, I think um, really, as I was saying before, I think, um, and to Christopher's point, I actually would focus more on on the story and establishing the story and getting it out there. And I think you've got a better chance of getting it picked up the way that Gary picked up the the Kevin Rudd story. I, I would be putting more focus into getting the story up and running out there, using the powers that you now have, whether it's Twitter or Reddit or whatever community or Tumblr or However, you, however you, you know, using that or Facebook um, and getting it out there and getting getting it to have some legs, and I, I think that probably will um, will have a, a better chance, frankly, of sending in a press release anymore or of um, trying to get through on 
on the phone to people who don't even listen to their voicemail anymore. Um, in terms of if you are sort of taking that more traditional um, approach, yes, absolutely, having um, things like video is, is very important. Um, a video is, um, you know, a huge, a huge focus for, uh, for companies like uh, News and Fairfax at the moment. Um, it's an area where we can, um, uh, frankly, focus uh, more on, or there's more of ability for us to, to look at ways of generating revenue through um, video, whereas if you look at where we're going with mobile phones, it's harder than ever to, to make um, revenue through there. So video, yes, if you are um, taking that route, um, is, is something that, that we'd be interested in. But look, I, I would focus more on trying to get the story out there um, initially um, yourself. So that's uh, an interesting point. Get, um, about First of all, I think two things there. One, we come back to the video, but getting that story up and running does put a lot of, um, I think, pressure back on NGOs to get those skills and get them accessible. Gary, do you sort of agree with that perspective? Yeah, look, I mean, I also agree with Chris, too. we're all starting to agree with each other. <laughs> I'm not going to be a punch up here. No. Um, Just something about that. <laughs> look, I sit in news story idea conferences most days with journalists and um, after 30 years in the business, many of them still come up with a great idea and they go, oh, why don't we do a story on homelessness? And I go, well, that's boring. That's really boring as a topic. What is the story? What's the idea? And I think you all have to be, you know, think of yourselves as journalists and you're pitching up a story to an editor. What's the idea? What's the pitch? And you've got to be really creative about it. I mean, come and invite one of our prominent journos to go and spend $35 a day and see how they survive for a week or two. Then I might read that story as a way in. Then you can put the data and you can put the campaign and the cause around it. But it's no good just pitching up stories that are, oh, we've got a video and you can interview uh, someone who's homeless or someone who's down on their luck. You need to have that scope and that spine to the story. You need to have a narrative, basically, and you need to help us out with that narrative. So you oh. need to think you know, creatively. You're, you're almost like, you've got to think of yourselves as creative agencies almost, I think, in a way, because like Chris said, the story hasn't changed. Stories don't change. How we tell stories, the basis of the story is there. You know, storytelling is the oldest art form known to all of us. Not even an art form, it's, it's instinctive in us. It's wired into us. We listen to stories. We learn about, we, we learn things from stories more than we learn them from PowerPoint presentations. You know, there's been all these studies done on um, uh, the fact that people will look at numbers and, and point by point, but if you put it into a, a narrative in a story form, people will take more of that information in because as humans we identify with, with a narrative and I think that's really important to remember whenever you're pitching up a story or you're trying to get a cause out there you need to think of the story arc and you need to think of where it's going and I mentioned audience earlier but also bring it down it's a fragmented audience out there so bring that area of interest down to something that is quite obtainable and hits people in the stomach you know more than just the head I think rather than going through everybody w with each point, I will sort of try to move through some points. How much time have we got, Fernando? Uh, probably another 20 minutes. Oh, we've got another 20 minutes. Yeah. We've got plenty of time. And would anyone like to add something now? I mean, I would like to pick up on something um, Chris said, Christopher said about um, the sort of need to get the hits can overwhelm the story. And, you know, um, I, I think that that is a really critical question because even today going to the Daily Telegraph website, you know, for the People's Plan, it was sliding down and the other stories were sliding up, particularly the ones that can get the hits. You know, is there, and taking on board Gary, you know, the idea that people do have to be able to get the story out there, be journalists themselves and all of that. Is there a danger that once the paywalls go up or the advertising model really takes off that the, the story can get forced out? Yeah, I mean, it's a different world once you've got paywalls up and around. You know, News Limited are experimenting with them at the moment. We're looking at them and thinking about them and thinking how we'll model it and looking at how the New York Times have done it. And that could change the game a fair bit uh, down the track. In what way? Well, I think what you'll, what you'll see is um, 
again, it's about audience. So what are they willing to pay for and what sort of information are they willing to impart with? Because at the moment, they pay a dollar fifty or a dollar or two dollars for a newspaper anyway, which is one of the most mobile devices around. Um, so, I mean, they're used to paying. It's just what will they pay for in the future that they can't get from those content farms out there on the web. I mean, most news out there is it's pretty easy to, to obtain. It's very easy to find. Everyone's aggregating it and rejigging it and sending it out again. What they're looking for is fresh and innovative and original content. And um, what we've been saying uh, for the last few years, and it's the same at News Limited and, and most of the other media outlets, you, you've got to create, not collate. Um, and whatever that model is in future, if it's 60% original material on our websites and 40% collated from wire services and elsewhere, well, fine. But we know that we need original content there, and that means in, in all of its forms, both in, in the written form and visualisation as well. I mean, all the new mapping techniques and the data mining that are coming out now that are allowing us to do our journalism in a lot more intensive way where we can take readers on a real deep dive into a topic. So if it was a topic on, say, homelessness, um, you could pull together all of the stats in the ABS and come up with something really interesting where your readers can go right, go right down. But we need to find a model to pay for this journalism. And this is the, you know, nasty little truth about what's happening in the media right now is that um, what we call print dollars and digital dimes <laughs> Well, for every dollar in uh, print that you receive from advertising, you in the past have been able to get about 10 cents digitally. Now that's changing. It's up to 40 or 50 cents or whatever it is now. But there's still a disparity there. And you know we're grappling with that at the moment. How are we going to fund our journalism in future? Does it mean that we will have smaller newsrooms but with more focused new staff? And I, I think that's what we've been seeing around the world. I mean, what did we see? 1,100 layoffs at the Times in London earlier this year. That's one of the realities. Um, Christopher, I'd like to ask you now, um, I, I understand that you've actually been doing some investive journalism over a choice. So to some extent, you've actually done what um, uh, Gary was talking about. You've actually taken journalism in-house. I know you've always been doing choice, so in a sense, Australian Consumers Association is different anyway. What's been your experience with that, both with doing it, what drove you to do it, and s getting the story out there? Has that been just as difficult as it, you yeah, well it, it's imagined or we, not We always difficult? have this debate, what is choice? Is it uh, a testing agency? Is it a publisher? <coughs> uh, what is it? But I was very keen that they sort of upped the journalistic ante, because actually I thought we sell two things uh, at choice. Uh, probably the most important is trust, in that people trust the information. And the way to get to the bottom of that, that information is through the research you do in laboratories, testing microwaves. But actually, the bit that really I think is more interesting is really testing <coughs> markets and see how they work in consumer areas. So in uh, the April magazine, we're looking at supermarkets, surprise, surprise. So there's been quite a bit of work there in terms of the supermarkets, how they work in terms of screwing producers as well as consumers or, or whatever. So we've sought to up the journalistic background, but look, it's the same as Gary says. Uh, we actually had a paid for online model uh, from the year 2001. We were very early into that, but I'm afraid that doesn't, uh, what, what has changed over time is the incredible level of competition of material that is free in terms of user reviews. So you can find out about microwaves just by putting it in there it might not be someone who, in a completely independent way, has tested it umpteen times, but sheer, by the sheer number of aggregated uh, views from people, it should give you a good idea if it's worked. And the other problem with consumer groups, not just choice more generally, they've all been around 50 years, they've tested things, they've lifted standards. So whereas you had toasters exploding in the 1960s, now because of safety standards, mandatory and otherwise, because of uh, consumers being more selective, Actually, most of the products are really in a fairly tight band. Um, they vary in design and price, but in terms of performance, there's not always a massive difference. So again, why would people pay extra uh, to get that test? So I think it is 
incumbent on choice to push more into those sort of market analysis, that sort of investigative so, journalism. So you're in a sense in the same position as, um, as the others, it's just that you're yeah. in a different well, sector. Marnie, you're in a really different position because um, New Matilda is, a, um, is free to anyone and it depends on uh, donations, supporters, it doesn't have, it has a little bit of advertising. So how difficult is that? Is that a viable model, do you think, uh, as an alternative? And what's its limitations, as well as its strengths? Um, it depends who your audience is. I mean, it's, I think it's a viable model at the moment. We are struggling a little bit, but we're managing to get by. Um, it's really a model based on people being quite engaged in the outlet, rather than a newspaper, which you sort of read and then don't think about it again. You Matilda, people comment, they sit there all day and you know talk about things, um, and they, almost feel like they have some sort of ownership over it. Um, I guess it's almost like a public radio station where people, they're not, it, there's no paywall so anyone can read it and a lot more people read it than pay for it. Um, but the people who do pay for it feel like they're members of some sort of club I guess and um, they're getting giveaways, they're getting, per, uh, they're getting incentives to, to pay for it but they're not having to pay for it to access it. Um, just, I just wanted to pick up on, on some of the things that have been said about how to get a story into the media. We're in a different position because we probably do rely more on freelancers than the bigger newsrooms um, and therefore work with not-for-profits more than the bigger newsrooms. Um, we've noticed a shift uh, towards communications workers submitting entire features for publication at New Matilda and I know that I've spoken to Sophie Black at Crikey and she gets the same thing where people write the feature, they speak to the sources themselves and then send the completed feature in. That actually for us is not a great way to um, to get to get published I guess because we see that as, it's almost like an extended press release. We, we see you as an invested source, we see you as someone who is within the sector speaking to people who are also within the sector um, and the information that you give us, we're going to have to pick it apart anyway as journalists or editors to fact check it and make sure that, you know, cross-reference it, etc. Better, the better thing to do if you've got something exclusive, and I guess I um, disagree with David a bit here, don't put it out on social media. Actually approach someone directly and say, I'm going to give this to you only. Um, let's work on this together and make it a story that, you, that that outlet has some exclusivity over. And that way, they'll be interested, they'll be willing to put the effort in to, to build the story with you and offer to work with them on the research, give them the sources, give, point them to the right um, reports, data, etc. because you're actually an expert in your field. You're not um, a journalist, <laughs> um, but you are an expert source, and I think that's what's appealing to smaller outlets, is that you have all of that background knowledge, you're act actually saving us time in researching that information by coming to us, but we would prefer to work with you rather than receive a feature that's already written. I think we should take some um, questions now because I'm sure we've got things, um, questions you want to raise. Just one tiny point I'll make coming out of that. One of the points that I meant to emphasise but didn't is that I think it's not an either or and I'm sure you agree with this but actually when you look at the development of stories, I once did a 20 years on deaths in custody and you can see it coming from the grassroots into the non-mainstream, into the mainstream, back out of the mainstream and then coming back up again. So, you know, I think it, it, there's sort of an interaction in terms of the news agenda between all these different layers of media. Um, Julie, um, yeah, Julie's got a question. Um, Julie Mack in Greenpeace. Um, great, great to hear from everyone on the panel, but I'd be interested to hear the panel's thoughts on the essential conflict, uh, certainly coming from Greenpeace, where we would be pitching stories and we would be doing research and, you know, packaging movies and doing stunts. Um, but the problem is we, c we can pitch it to, you know, mainstream media or New Matilda or whoever. Um, but we're giving it to you because we've got a big agenda. We want change. We're campaigning. We want an outcome. And surely, I mean, as a journalist, you guys are in a difficult position, are you not? Um, because your job is to report the news. Our job is to get an outcome. Can, can the panellists talk a little about that essential conflict between where we're both coming from? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I guess I'd go, for, for me, I'd go back to, to my original point about um, do, you, do you need to sell your story to um, an organisation that is in a different business to you? Can't you go, and Greenpeace as an organisation knows its audience and its members, 
better than anyone. I guess you're trying to get out of that that core group and get. Um, but you know, I think you. I really, you know, would encourage you to spend some time looking at. Um, at uh, you know how whether or not you can get directly and ha you know to people and have a bigger impact um, than trying to sell us a particular story that you know it may not particularly mesh with 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 our audience and you know every media product is a is a product it is a service they are trying to get through to a particular audience we're much more conscious of that than than we used to be um, so I think you really have to weigh up um, who who your um, who your target audience is. Is it other media or is it, you know, going directly to, to your audience? Um, you, you know, you'd have to have to weigh it up and, and spend some time looking at that, I think. And I think that is fascinating because I think that is something that has changed. I don't think 10 years ago that would have been uh, something that would have been said at a forum like mm. this. So I think that's uh, very interesting. Look, could, could I just add to that? I mean, look, Greenpeace, you are advocates, unashamed. But journalists want stories, so they're naturally going to want to balance that. If I would give any advice, gratuitous to those gathered here, is you know rely on the subtext, put the megaphone away sometimes. I really hate this word messaging. All the time we're surrounded by people in politics, and I'm afraid in PR, what's the message? Messages can be manipulated. Messages are propaganda. I believe, naively perhaps, stories aren't. Stories have this deep, you know, in, in my guts, and I'm sure in many of us around here, we know when we find a story. We feel it in a very m mindful human sense. So, you know, when you've got a great story, as you have, Greenpeace have, the things they found out, things they put on, perhaps, you know, let the call to action, let that, let that ride a bit lower for a while. Just let that story get some legs of its own. Then you can, you know, get the megaphone out. But I'm afraid when you put everything, you, 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 you load it the other way around, Journalists get very, uh, you know, turned off by a lot of that. Uh, Gary, you were interested. No, no, that's fine. Um, another question. Um, uh, yes, over here and then over there. Yeah, over here. Yeah. You want to introduce yourself? Yep. Hi, I'm Jane Burrows from Volunteering Victoria, um, and I'm a bit. I'm a bit worried, actually, by the focus, um, for, although I'm very, very grateful for your attendance, um, by the uh, big media representatives on the panel on fragmented audiences and serving their needs, because picking up on what the lady from Greenpeace just said, the fact is that quite often in this room, what we're trying to present is stories that aren't necessarily terribly palatable. You don't necessarily want to sit down over your cornflakes and read about someone who's having a crappy time on Newstart. Or we're trying to we're trying to actually affect change in the community. So that means that we we need to reach people who don't necessarily want to be reached by our story. And in my in my kind of view, that's part of what journalists have always done for us. And now you're saying that that that's basically you're not prepared to do it. And um, or maybe you are, but only if we can prove first that the general community is interested in this story by making it go viral in some way, by getting social media support. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being deliberately um, kind of, I'm deliberately extreme in, in the way I'm presenting what you've said or interpreting what you've said. But I'm interested to know whether you've got, whether you've got a solution for us, because in many ways, you know, and the other the other factor is that a lot of people in this room would be working alone in their organisation, quite possibly not full time. You know, resources are a big issue for us. So, how can we make it work? How can we actually work this model? Um, is there some way? Is, can we leverage the relationship between in independent media and mainstream media, for example? What 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 can you offer us apart from just that we need to get you know, many, many thousands of people talking on Twitter about our issue before you'll even look at it. Sorry, um, sorry if that's a little bit. That's, <laughs> no, that's a good point. Um, and I don't want to sound superficial or extreme either, but I have to say, uh, you're, you're asking what's in it for you uh, and what we can do for you. Uh, the question is what you can do for us. Okay? And what... I don't know if that's the question. Is that, is that the question? <laughs> okay, well, let's first, of all, let's first of all have a look at the media and, the, say, the mass media. What are they? The businesses, okay? If you, don't, if you don't get the revenue in and you don't attract the readership, you're out of business. That's not all they are. No, no, and 
Uh, have a look at most of the, the fundamental social changes that have taken place in Australia. Have they been covered by the mass media or not? And have many changes that have happened over the last 10, 20, 100 years have come about because of what the mass media has brought into, into the equation in society? I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd defy anyone here to say that the mass media hasn't done a, a good job at highlighting social inequality. Gary, it's there on the pages of the papers and the Sydney Morning Herald and the Daily Telegraph every day. There are stories in these papers and on the websites. You can't say that we're not keeping an eye on those social issues. We do, we do that. What I'm saying is that the media world has changed and our audiences have changed. And if we, if we go on ignoring that changing readership and the fragmentation that is happening, and trust me, it is happening. I watch it every day. Then we're out of business and then so are you. critical sort of issue, is there a real risk here? This is where we're talking about risk. Is there some sort of thing happening where maybe the stories won't be there? And that's why it's, it's sort of so important to have some solutions. Yeah, then we don't necessarily offer you all the solutions. Can I just add uh, Yeah, no, I've got a lot of people wanting to ask <laughs> questions. I, I know you did, and then we'll go to there, and then over here, and then over here. I think this point follows on a bit. Um, I wanted to, sorry, Chris Toomey from Wacos. I wanted to raise the dilemma that we face as advocates for disadvantaged and vulnerable people as service users when they become the sources for a story. Because we're often, um, you know, advocating around a particular issue. We'll often be approached by journalists who will interview us, get our, our opinions, our thoughts and our analysis, and then be asking us to put them in touch with service users. And often we then face a dilemma both because um, you know, we have a responsibility to them as service users that they then um, won't necessarily be um, experienced with dealing with the media. They will often present things where they will say things somewhat naively or, or, or not put them well. And also then we'll also feel like a lot of the work we've done as advocates, we then get cut out or sidelined from the story. So it's a balance for us at, to, to be able to tell when when is it safe, you know, in terms of knowing a journalist, to pass them on to some of the people who are our service users, whether or not they understand, um, you know, uh, the, the wider context and, and, you know, the possibility that a campaign that we've been working on for a long time will suddenly get sidetracked because a disadvantaged person we're, we're um, working with suddenly says, well, actually, I think the problem's the Africans next door or, or something bizarre and strange like that. Um, th yeah, there was a debate um, in professional journalism a few years ago about um, the responsibility that um, that we have to the people that we interview. And um, it, you're talking about a question of ethics, really, and it's a question that every journalist you know, must ask themselves every time they speak to any interviewee. Um, and we're not probably very good at, at doing this. We don't like to do it because it might wreck our story. But um, the debate was around, um, you know, uh, what what will be the impact of the story on this person once it ends up on the front page of the newspaper? Um, I absolutely think that's a part of the responsibility um, uh, uh, of the journalist. Um, but and I understand that, you, that that you won't have the same resources as a as a you know publicity or a marketing um, uh, or a media unit in a in a big company. But but you know you need you need to be in control of of your story. And if you don't, if you um, see that as a risk. Um, you, you have to understand that risk and calculate whether or not that's worth um, taking that step or not. I'd, I'd use another word which would be trust. And I know that journalists and trust don't normally go close together in the, in the public conversation, but you actually have to trust journalists. Because in my experience, and I hope in many of yours, certainly there are ones who will let you down, but most of the people, most of the time, want to do the right thing. And in a way, you, the intermediaries, you can introduce them to the talent. I think we call them talent as opposed to surface users, but let's say people, because that's really what it's all about. Um, and certainly there are safeguards, and certainly your voice will get in there too, because that's the sort of overarching umbrella. You can say what the campaign is, but it's actually what sells the story is, is the voice of that person. Uh, and they might say things that aren't on your list of approved messages, but thank God for that because we are different, and sometimes the, the story might be different from your campaign even. Perhaps 
the journalist contacting those individuals might find something that really is something different. And it might not align always with exactly what you want, but perhaps it will touch something that perhaps is even more important, who knows? So I would just say, you know, trust and be open. And I was having a coffee with a journalist yesterday and I said I was coming to this panel. And she said, oh my God, <laughs> you know, the NGO. Whenever I do a story, the first question they ask is, what's your agenda? And she was generally affronted by that. She said, I don't have an agenda. I might work, it might be owned by some you know, devilish multinational uh, media proprietor, but I don't have an agenda. And I, I think that that's generally true. I've worked for Channel 9, I've worked for the Melbourne Truth, I've worked for the Manchester Guardian. The only agenda has been a good story. Sorry to keep banging that drum. That's what the editors want us to bring back. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Chris. I, I often say that. Uh, journos barrack for the story. Quite often we don't... I mean, we'll have feelings about one side or another because we're human, but we barrack for a good yarn. That's what we're interested in. That's what we're here for. That's what we get excited about. And, you know, one of the questions for all you guys is how well do you know the journos that you're dealing with? Have you studied them? Have you researched them? Have you looked them up and read all their copy? Have you made a phone call out of the blue and said, gee, I really love that story you did today? Because let me tell you, flattery is the best form of <laughs> winning over a journo. I've got away with not giving people pay rises in the newsrooms for years by just sending them a handwritten note, you know. And that's just a, it's just a nice way to establish a rapport with the people that you will be dealing with. You find out who goes the round that is most dedicated to your area, get to know them. television, I mean, it happened to me once when I was working 60 minutes, you know, I made a guarantee to a source, turns out the bit of stuff read was in the promo and I was devastated, you know. Um, I was quite a junior researcher then, it's a long time ago, but I mean, I've heard of other journalists. So, to what extent are journalists able to, um, in all environments, make that sort of, you know, have those straight dealings? Yeah, I mean, look, this happens a lot and a lot of people walk away from their dealings with us pretty disenchanted, I've got to say, and we've talked about it a lot, and you tr I mean, I've pulled stories, David was talking about there, um, I've pulled stories out of the paper when I think occasionally some people are going to be hit with 40 radio newsroom you know, reporters on their doorstep the next morning when the paper comes out, and they're not going to know how to cope with it. And for the sake of just running one great headline and one-off story, um, we've often made the decision to pull them out. You don't see the stories that we don't do. You don't see the stories that we pull out and the arguments and the debates that we have in newsrooms and at news conference about what goes in and what stays out. I mean, it's easy to think of us as you know, horned devils who are just there for a 100-point headline and a large readership. But we actually debate this hour by hour, day by day, and it goes on in, in all newsrooms around the country. Um, so... Unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you, Wendy, because um, it, it's a case-by-case -case example and, and I think you have to obviously have some experience. So you were inexperienced with that um, mishap that you had. Um, there are so many things at play through the editing process, through the production process. Uh, you know, things just happen and I always say that, you know, whenever a, there's a good mood in a newsroom, I always say be very careful because there's something is about to bite us right on the arse. Um, whenever something's going well and it means that we've got something wrong or we've got the wrong photograph in or, or whatever it was. So always walk on eggshells. Thank you, Kurt. Down here and then over here for sure. Yeah, over here. Hi, I'm Kerry from the Heart Foundation. I'd be interested in, from your perspective, what do you think charities get wrong most often when they pitch the story? Is there like a certain element missing? I mean, our internal struggle is trying to t tell our internal colleagues the difference between worthy and newsworthy. Um, and I'd be very interested just to hear what you think our most common mistakes are. Yeah. Um, I actually was going to make a comment when this person over here made a comment. Hello. Yes? Can you hear me? Is it on? Try that. Is that okay? Oh, okay. That makes sense. Um, so I was going to make a comment before about, um, I, ca I can't remember what you said your name was, but you were saying people don't want to wake up in the morning and read about some poor person on Newstart struggling. Um, I think that is the biggest mistake in, p in articles that we get 
uh, pitched is that people focus on someone struggling. Actually, what media and NGOs have in common is that we both want to hold powerful interests to account. So I think you need to look at, okay, why is that person struggling? Has the government done something wrong? Um, who else can we... What's... <laughs> pardon? Who else can we blame? But look at that. Rather than saying, look at this poor story, look at this poor person, I think... I think personal stories are key to telling a good story but actually they're not the nub of the story someone having a bad time in Marrickville <coughs> isn't a story necessarily but looking at a structural problem that has caused that person to have a bad time is a story and then that person is the talent for the story so I think we the pictures that we get tend to focus on the fact that people are having a hard time and yes you're right people don't want to wake up and read that over breakfast um, anybody else on that one are we going to do another question we'll look over here Um, also offer up some potential solutions as well. That's, I don't get a lot of that and I haven't seen that over the years where um, I don't think readers and, and particularly us in the newsrooms want another harping story. I mean, yes, there is an issue there that needs to be addressed, so let's address it, but what are also the alternative solutions around it and who do we need to go to? And, you know, I, d I just think that's when I got back to that first point I made earlier, think creatively. And, you know, if you're going to pitch up an idea or a, particularly a campaign, um, think about all those other issues. What can be done to solve this thing? Because the media right now, as you've seen with the Telegraph's um, People's Plan and elsewhere, campaigning is, you know, qu quite a, a buzzword in the media these days. It has been for a long time, but more so now where we need to ha establish a closer rapport with our audiences. Just make a, a quick add to that if the mic's working or not. And that's get some great talent on your side from your organisation to speak. Look, if the CEO, CEO can't cut it, get somebody who can. And it doesn't matter, uh, you know, if they just have that authenticity and integrity to reflect the organisation and can spit it out, that's fantastic. But people who are long-winded and boring, it doesn't matter how worthy or newsworthy, it ends up on the floor. That seems to be going back to basic principles that we... Uh, yes, over here. I'm Judith Toakley from Uniting Care Australia. I'd like to hop back into the space talking about, you know, where does the story come from and how do we pitch it and blah, blah, blah. And um, you mentioned that media relations are an important part of the way we do our work. Um, during the poker machine debate in the last nine months, we've certainly tracked every story, as well as many as we could pick up. And um, we've contacted the journalists who've written about the story. We haven't a decent database of who's written about it, whether it was balanced or not, which stable it came from, which electorate the paper was in, and we particularly focused on regional media. And um, so our media relations, I thought, were pretty solid under those circumstances. Um, we too have really incredibly limited resources, and I think we're all struggling with that, regardless of which side of the fence you're on on some of this stuff. I guess... Um, It'd be interesting to know, I mean, is it, call me a dinosaur, but, you know, there used to be a time when journos would contact us and have a yarn or have a coffee, you know, keep in touch with their sources, have their little black book, you know. Um, it, it sounded to me like the responsibility is pretty largely on the shoulders of individuals in organisations to pitch the story. And yes, of course, that's part of what we do. But um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on whether or not journalists have time to just, you know, to continue to establish those relationships and ring up and have a yarn and see if there's a decent story around. Who would like to begin on that one? Uh, certainly um, we have less time and less people to go out and, and have that, those coffees. That's a, that, that's a reality um, of where we are. Um, even And also, um, th as you know, I said earlier on, we are, f we are more knowledgeable about our audiences, more focused on what our audiences want. Um, and, um, uh, and, you know, particularly now with paid content, we're, you know, even more focused on, on um, the stories that we can tell that will get that people to see a great value in those stories. Um, we do, you know, tend to rely on analytics and things more, more than we did in the, in the past. Um, there are, you know, these efficiencies that come into the newsroom that enable us to, um, to you know, to attain targets and and um, uh, and um, you know whether it's audiences or um, or, or um, some sort of result for our journalism, um, perhaps in a more effective way than sending out the, the, the ten or twenty people in the newsroom to, to go and have 
copies at random. We all um, know that that's the best way um, to, to get a story and the best way to, to have establish ongoing relationships that will, not the first or second or third, but maybe the fifth time we meet up, result in that fantastic um, scoop for us. So we definitely you know, would like to be doing that um, more, but you know, the reality is there, are, there, are, um, there is more um, looking for news within the newsroom using technology than, than there used to be. So I would definitely say, you know, if you can be as proactive as you can, and it sounds like you've, you've um, got a really good uh, um, approach to that with um, keeping your, your database and, and your records of, of who you're talking to, I'd say that that will definitely you know, need to be a continuing trend for you. Unfortunately, the days of the big boozy lunch are over, though, from, from our point of view. Oh, quick coffee. Come into our office, eh? We haven't got the travel time anymore. I'd just add the thing about training. Uh, and one thing, we've talked about technology changing. I wonder a lot about the training of journalists, and I know that there are lots of colleges, some represented here. But you guys, I hope it already happened, should engage with the training of journalists through the schools, through the media organisations, because it's really those sort of interventions that can make a difference down the track. It's a bit of a long-term solution. <coughs> Um, over here, and then Tom. Yeah, I've got one at home. Um, sorry. <laughs> Graham Cole from Wesley Mission. Just, look, I've, I've, I've sat in news conferences and so on, like Gary. Um, I worked on the Australian and TUE and suburban newspapers. I think one of the things, like, we, this sector is now the biggest employer in Australia. And one of the things I, I, I found over the years was, um, you know, when I was down at News Limited and they were training journalists and so on, You'd have the Confederation of Australian Industry in there. You'd have the New South Wales Rugby League. You'd have the peak bodies from all over Australia in there talking to cadet journalists. Um, you know, I think too we've got a responsibility on our side to to educate. Christopher has been talking about that a bit, but you know, I think part of the problem that we've got today, what I've been hearing on the floor, is you know we're we're a sector that's very process orientated. Um, you know, quite often we get called up for a, uh, a case study at one o'clock in the afternoon and you know it's not going to meet deadline. We're not going to be able to find a case study in a couple of hours, do the story and nail it. And this is one of the things, we've got to get out there and start educating the sector, uh, the media, because we're in a situation now where, um, you know, we are the biggest employer in Australia. Um, you know, it's not the retail sector, but we aren't heard and we don't make our presence felt with the media. And I think Christopher was hitting upon that with education and so on. But a lot more needs to be done in that sector. Um, I, I think that's what, um, in a small way, I was trying to say when I was uh, talking about the um, press council, uh, that's another issue. But I still think even with the people's plan, there is a potential for people to get organised and have a voice. You know, so, and I don't think there's any way of getting away from this change. I mean, seriously, I think what's been said here is that people, and I know many journalists who don't have the time to leave the building, and uh, you know, things have changed. Uh, Tom Morton. Um, this is just a, an observation and really a question about the audience, because we've heard a lot about knowing your audience and being in touch with your audience and so on. Um, but before I get to that, the, I mean, part of that is there's this conception of, you know, we, we, people don't want to read unpalatable stories over their cereal, et cetera, et cetera. Probably the biggest story in Australia last year was also the most unpa unpalatable story that we could probably imagine, yeah? The Indonesian mistreatment of Australian cattle in Indonesian abattoirs. The executive producer of Four Corners said that she could see the audience figures plummet from the first five minutes of that story, yeah? It had the smallest audience of any story that Four Corners broadcast last year, but it was certainly the most influential. It won the Gold Walkley, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess this goes to my question now. Um, I think the problem for, for most people in this audience is that they, they, that they have multiple audiences, yeah? There's not just the audience in terms of the the media audience, the, the readers, viewers, listeners, but the real audience is people in power because you know, what you're about when you do stories is actually wanting to affect change, having influence on the policy process. And you need the media to reach that audience as well as the audience of ordinary listeners, viewers, readers and so on. So I'm just interested in the panel's perhaps reflections on that, that challenge of having that dual audience. I mean, 
I don't think one of us up here said that um, we don't want to do unpal unpalatable stories over brief. That came from the audience, I think. Um, and yes, in newsrooms, we often talk about will they like to read this over their cornflakes? And we debate that. And it doesn't stop us, though, from running those sort of stories. And I, the biggest issue in newsrooms right now is how do we protect that sort of journalism from all of the change that's going on around us and the fragmentation with our audiences? How do we protect that and still do those big stories that really matter and that bring about change? Uh, because they're not sexy stories. You know, it's not Pamela Anderson in a bikini on the homepage pulling in hundreds of thousands of hits all the time for us. But that kind of stuff, hopefully, will pay for the other stuff that we really want to do and that we're really passionate about as journalists. And, you know, I haven't seen... What, what you're actually seeing around the world right now is a, an increasing commitment towards investigative journalism. I mean, ten years ago we were talking about the death of investigative journalism and how it was dying out. And I think just about every news um, organisation here is now saying we need to commit, we need more resources, and we've actually beefed up our investigative units at Fairfax, particularly out of Melbourne where most of it, a lot of our investigative reporters are based. And we just have a really strong commitment to it. And they may not necessarily be stories that will get picked up by commercial radio, but they are stories that are really important and they represent what we do. So, you know, I might say, yes, we are chasing audiences. Of course we are. We're a commercial media organisation. We have to do that. We're not going to commit suicide by not going after them. But we're also trying to cultivate and bring about a new generation of investigative reporting in this country that um, I think is really encouraging. You know, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know how we will be publishing our material in 10 years' time. I mean, if you'd have said to me five years ago we'd be producing The Age and the City Morning Herald and The Telegraph and The Oz on one of these touchscreen apps uh, on an iPad, I would have said, you're kidding. So I don't know in 10 years if we'll be having a holograph of a 10-year-old newspaper boy shouting out the headlines beamed into your living room. <laughs> I mean, I don't know that. But what I do know is that, as, as everyone has said here, the story and the commitment to the story will remain the same. Does that make a really... I ask you a question, and sorry, Dave, sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, Yes, the growth of investigative journalism. To what extent do you see collaboration there as possible, either with, um, you know, potentially universities, NGOs, uh, you know, or has it always got to be the media in isolation? Yeah, I mean, you, you might do something in partnership with an NGO, and I can see that happening where there is a campaign built around some of the investigative journalism that we're doing, and you've come up, you might come up with an issue that, or we might find the issue that is relevant to your body, and we might be able to work together to collaborate on that. But the, the essence, the heart, the journalism has got to come out of our newsrooms. I mean, that's what we do. Uh, and also out of some of the university, the journalism schools. I mean, we've been seeing increasing examples of that, I think, over the last five years. Um, yeah, we did, uh, when I was at um, news.com, we did, uh, as an example, uh, uh, worked with a very small, just a, a couple of um, few people who were um, trying to um, get some children in a village in the Solomon Islands, some Christmas presents or, and some um, educational resources, and we did a little kind of interactive and work with them, um, and we called it a adopt a village, which probably wasn't the best name, but we so I think very open to doing those things, but again, it will come back to the to the story and how um, and you know how we can involve our audiences in that, and we we found our audiences really interested in that. Uh, I just don't want to say we don't give you the impression that we do sit looking at those dashboards um, uh, and move stories up and down, and that's all we do. I I have made the mistake of doing that, being an online editor in the past, and quickly found that our home page, um, uh, you know, <laughs> looked looked. It had a very negative effect on the image and reputation of our website. So I have tried that and probably most people who've worked in online have tried that to, to see what happens. Um, we are very concerned we, with the reputation of our paper, about how people feel about our mastheads and our brands. Um, and the reason why, um, you know, papers and websites particularly attached to, um, you know, to major news brands aren't um, just full of celebrity news because we could be and getting the hits up is because we recognise that if we did that, you know, we wouldn't be, you know, we'd be creating an environment that would make people feel bad about themselves if they're always reading that stuff. So for, for ourselves it is a mix and doing those stories may not be, you know, be read as by as many people but they are incredibly beneficial to us 
um, in, in ways other than you know the number of people that, that read that or hits on the, on the ad attached to that page. I think we'll take one more question and we'll begin to wrap up the panel. Anyone else got a question? Yes. Uh, hello, Gabriel Rich from TASCOS. Um, you were talking, David, about analytics and just mentioned there about hits on celebrity versus more worthy stories, what do you want to call it? Uh, what is the an analytics on um, welfare, social equity kind of stories? I mean, are they getting, are readers a bit engaged with them? Are, are, they, are they healthy enough to say, yes, they earn their place on a website, on the news website? I'm going to go back to the same answer you've heard a lot, a lot of times today, but they, they will win. The story is great. Um, the, if we set up an index page on our website that was called homelessness next to one that was called celebrity news, it's not going to get the same hits. But, but if, you a, if you had a story, uh, homeless mother living in an abandoned car with three children in Penrith, then you would see that story going off like anything on the web. Yeah. So. Yeah, for us, it's not about the category of story. It really is about the story. Um, and, yeah, I, I know you've heard that a lot today, but, but, it, but it really is the case for us. <laughs> Just one, one more. <laughs> I think, I think uh, our servers would crash, I think. <laughs> I'd like to look at that too. Okay, I'm wondering if, um, if each of the panellists would just like to say one thing or something you feel we haven't covered, um, starting with Christopher. Okay, well, I've been reminded of my journalistic training, which was on the Yorkshire Evening Press, and it was a very old daily evening newspaper in Yorkshire. And the first day, the editor took me round, and I remember he took me to the library, and he, I won't try and imitate his Yorkshire accent, but basically said, lad, them's the only people who know what's going on here. That was the woman in the, women in the library, as they were then. Then he went to the switchboard, and he said, you've got to make, pe you've got to make right with these people because they can make your life heaven or hell, depending you treat them with respect. And that was the, pe the telephonists, you know, and the coffee takers. Then he took me to the newsroom, and there wasn't many people there. And he said, lad, that's your desk. I never want to see you at it, because when you're at the desk, you're not working. You're only working when you're outside on the mean streets of York. <laughs> and... I suppose the moral of that is I've heard, you know, Gary saying that everyone's by the computer and no one leaves the building. Uh, look, I don't think there are many stories on Google, but your challenge is to get the journalists away from the building, away from their computers, get them to see the people that you see, and it won't happen overnight, but I think that will begin, hopefully, to make a bit of a change and you'll get more of the kind of stuff you want on the papers or wherever. Um... I guess I'd just wrap up by saying we've all discussed today that um, what we're interested in is a good story, but we haven't really talked about what makes a good story. So if you're not sure about that, then I'd probably recommend um, finding out by either doing some sort of maybe a news writing course at UTS or, you know, something that actually teaches you what news values are, what journalists are looking for when they're looking for a good story. Um, and the other thing is that I agree with Tom when he said um, that audience isn't everything. Some of the stories that aren't some of the stories that make the biggest impact actually don't have, aren't very well watched or very well read. So do keep that in mind. It's not all about chasing hits. Uh, yep, I would, um, again, I've said it a couple of times, but I would really try to explore um, going directly to your audience. Um, we are blowing up our business models. So if you continue to go by your old strategy of sending out press releases and things, more and more you will find that will not work. Um, I'd really, really encourage you to try and explore. And the best way probably to learn about storytelling is to go out there and publish your own stories in all of these areas like um, you know, Reddit, Tumblr, Twitter, whatever it is. Um, for us, it will get th this will be um, a more and more difficult issue, everything we've talked about today. Um, you know, if, if those digital pennies have started to, to get a little bit further up and more valuable for us, we're now facing a situation where our audience is moving to mobile phones. 
again, it, uh, if, it, if we were earning a tenth of the money than we were from when we went from print to web, that's going to happen again as we move to mobile. There are some predictions saying half of all news will be consumed n not on tablets but on mobile phone screens um, in a few years' time. So, so this issue is going to get harder and harder and harder for us. So you've got, you know, if I were you, I would explode the model of, of how you deal with media and get out your stories at the moment and start from scratch again. I don't know if I can add any more to what's been said, so I'll leave you with a superficial remark. Um, when I was editor-in-chief of the Bulletin magazine, I had no budget, no marketing budget, and uh, the, I think the 125th anniversary of that now defunct magazine was coming up, and we had a very poor owner in uh, Kerry Packer, you may remember, and he wouldn't uh, loosen the purse strings. So I came up with the idea that we would... We offline? Um, I came up with the idea that we would uh, offer a $1.25 million reward for the capture of a live Tassie tiger because uh, there have been a couple of sightings down in Tasmania. And we ran it as a cover story, um, ran it across eight pages. The thing went absolutely ballistic. Um, I was on the phone doing radio interviews for about five straight days. I think we estimated the, the media spend worth as being in excess of $1.5 million. There was never any chance that anyone would capture the tiger. They had to get the but I spent six weeks with our lawyers working out the terms and conditions as well. Um, and then the possibility of taking it fit before Park Street and leaving it there with a member of the RSPCA was pretty long. Uh, but what you said to tell me is that there is a huge audience out there for just a really good story and, uh, and a bit of a stunt. So there you go. Good luck.